afternoon, everybody. You're all very, very welcome to the York Direct discussion this afternoon. My name is Megan Connery. I'm coming to you from Balsall on this dull November afternoon. I know we've people here from Sligo and further afield in Ireland and, and further again in other European countries. So you're all very, very welcome. We have lots of people watching with us today, all of them with an interest in farming, many with an interest in organic farming and specifically organic dairy farming. Just to let you know that this session is being recorded, so if you miss any of it or want to share it with anybody, it will be on the Europe Direct Sligo YouTube channel when it is complete. And any information that's imparted today along the lines of speaker slides, website references, points of information, they'll also be included on that. As you know, because you've tuned in, the purpose of the discussion tonight or this afternoon is to look at organic dairy farming in Ireland. I'd like to give a welcome to our panellists. I'm going to start by introducing each speaker and each speaker will say a few words and then we'll get into the wider discussion looking at the current framework of supports for organic dairy farming in Ireland and asking questions around is it enough to persuade conventional dairy farmers to convert to organic dairy farming based on the supports that are there at the moment and if not what do we need to do to make conversion to organic dairy farming more attractive or viable for those who are interested in that move. So what I'm going to do is introduce our first speaker to you and that is Daria Hyatt. She is Policy Officer for Organics in the Directorate for Agriculture and Rural Development of the European Commission. Um, this body drafts and negotiates the new European legislation for organics. So Daria will very much have a European overview for us. She also supervises control systems set up in the EU states. Now, before she started working with the Commission, she was also seven years in the Polish Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. So I'm sure she'd have some interesting parallels there. So I'm going to hand you over now to Daria and we'll have a few words from you, Daria. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for inviting our um, this webinar today. So today meeting is a great opportunity for me not only to tell you a few things um, from the European Commission perspective, but even what is more important for me to listen, uh, to hear your thoughts, hear your uh, views, opinions, and discuss further uh, with you the future of organic sector in Ireland. So since I have this privilege to, to begin, I wanted to share with you three messages that show what actually is happening with organic policy, uh, with this public quality scheme at the European Union uh, level. So in short, why everyone is speaking uh, about it now all over Europe. So message number one is that the, the policy political context has changed. This is the, let's say, new development. Development. The, the political context has changed a few months ago. From mid-December, we have the European Green Deal. And from May, we have two sectorial strategies, farm to fork and, and biodiversity strategy. And they give this impulse um, uh, that honestly can, can bring the organic sector to a completely a new uh, level. So at this point, you probably have heard about 25% target and organic moved in this political context from a position of being in the shadow, being treated as a niche a sector to become one of the cornerstones of the future European sustainable food um, systems. So a completely new political context is my first message uh, to you. And my second message is that rules for organic uh, production and controls and, and imports are changing. So me and my, uh, my uh, colleagues in my team, we are uh, um, uh, preparing a reform of, of the current uh, uh, organic uh, rules. So all these technical details um, um, uh, are, are being revised. So just a warning, uh, if you are thinking to join the organic farming community, please remember that from 1st January 2022, you will have to work based on this new set of uh, rules. And my second, my third message, my last message for this opening is that um, the Commission 
we we know that we don't know everything. So we know that political declara declarations and rules, they are not changing the reality. Uh, and we need more than that. So what we are doing now in the commission, we are carrying out a public consultations. We are asking you, we are asking everybody what actions, what projects, what ideas, recommendations you have uh, to help organic sector to grow to reach this target of 25%. Um, uh, so I kindly invite you that maybe uh, tomorrow or, or during the weekend after your uh, morning coffee, you take your computer in questionnaire we prepared for you. The consultations are open until 27 November and it's extremely important to learn from you what are the problems and what you think are uh, uh, good solutions uh, to help sector to grow. Uh, speaking about some maybe not legal uh, measures, but uh, let's say additional actions that could that could that could help. And I stop here uh, and I pass the word to the other speaker. Okay, very much for that, Daria. So three main points from Daria. She's talking about the political context, and I think you won't be the only person today. We mentioned the Green Deal, the biodiversity strategy, and farm to four. And she seeks to have organic farming as a cornerstone of farming in the, in the different regions. And also just alerting us to the new set of rules coming in in the next couple of years. And finally, to remind everybody to take part in the public consultation around organic farming. And we put the link to that at the end of this Zoom meeting. So there'll be plenty of time later on, I forgot to mention, for questions from, if you want to put questions to any of the panelists, you can just use the comment boxes there beside you on your, your Zoom screen. Our next speaker that we're going to ask to talk is Gillian Westbrook. Gillian is the CEO of the Irish Organic Association. You're very welcome, Gillian. And the Irish Organic Association is the main certifying body for organic production and processing in Ireland. Um, Gillian's worked for over 30 years in the area of food and agriculture law and policy, so she's a very wide overview of that. And she's worked in a wide range of agri-food business, including large cooperative companies, state agencies, artisan producers and farm lobby, lobby organisations. So very much experience of smaller and larger organisations. So Gillian, I'm going to hand over to you, please. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the invite. Um, I suppose, uh, well, it's said really there what we do. We're an organic certification body. We've been in operation since 1982. And um, we were the first organic certification body to, to operate in Ireland. And things have been growing steadily, although um, interesting enough, maybe not as fast as, as many other European countries. We're still very low on organic production here. We always hover around the uh, 1.5 to 2.4%, so still relatively low. Um, the Irish Organic Association, we do obviously certification, we do a lot more than just certification in the sense that we get very involved in promotion, um, policy, um, uh, we grace matter rights for the farming independent, etc. And we basically get involved with chefs and other networks and things to try to promote it. We work very closely, uh, as Daria from the EU Commission there will know with IFOM EU as well, um, or sorry, iPhone Organic Europe, as it's now called. Um, so we work very closely with them on regulations, and we've been very much involved in the um, lengthy uh, deliberation of probably the longest running deliberation of organic regulations in the history of the European Commission that's taken many years. Um, and we also welcome the European Commission's uh, uh, postponement for one year during, during COVID to actually bring in the new organic regulations. For organic farmers, uh, current organic farmers listening in, there will be changes, um, but, and we will be working uh, to inform all members and new, and new entrants what those changes will be. Um, but I don't think you should have much to worry about. There won't be anything that you won't be able to very easily achieve. Um, I don't. I think probably Ireland is probably least impacted by the current proposals that, that, that are there. Um, just on the on the issues of sustainability, just as an organisation, we very much see the organic regulation as a baseline. And what we like to see is um, not more regulations, but we like to see complementary measures, be it in agri-environment, climate, um, or GLOSS, uh, REPS, whatever we're going to call it next. Those things that actually get more environmental performance 
and um, etc., which we build on the baseline of organic regulation. And I think that's very important that we see it um, as that, that they, those are complementary issues or measures that are, are, should be available in future post-CAP 2020 to actually complement organic farming. So from a sustainability um, point of view, the carbon sequestration, the biodiversity, water quality, air quality, all those things that are very, very relevant um, are very relevant to organics. And we need to build on that organics. Um, to comply with the organic regulation, as I say, is a baseline, and then you build on that. And many, many of our farmers actually do that. They did go way beyond organic regulations, and um, they are to be applauded for that. Um, and I suppose last but not least, um, the Irish Organic Association is also the lead partner in um, maximising organic production systems, um, commonly known as MOPS, uh, and that is a European innovation partnership. And uh, we're looking, um, I believe, actually, we're the, we're the only um, EIP to look at market orientation. And we've got an awful lot more information on that on our website. And um, I know maybe it's not quite so relevant because it's for horticulturists, this particular project. But um, I don't go anywhere without promoting our EIP because it's a very good one and we're very proud of it. And we're getting some spectacular results. And I'd encourage everybody to look more at EIPs for the future um, because they really um, have got huge opportunity here in Ireland. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. So don't forget to EIPs and check out the the organic web the the web Gillian's website, which again will be at the end of this presentation. And so just to pick up on a couple of points that Gillian has made there, you know, at the moment there's 1.5 to 2.4 percent organic farmers in the country, so there's a quite a way to go if we're to reach targets of 25 percent. And I also know, Gillian, that you're saying that as well as supporting organic farmers. But you do a lot of work around sort of how their products are processed and used by the, the, the wider business and audiences as well. Uh, I suppose to take note too, which again I know other speakers are going to talk about looking at, but the regulations for organic farming are baseline regulations and it's really important that these regulations and regulations in other sectors complement each other so that farmers and other bodies are in a position to work together I suppose in, in a in, in, in a complementary fashion and in a way that it's, it's, it's to the greater good of the different industries that they're involved in. So thank you very much for that, Gillian. I'm going to call on our third panellist this evening now is John Liston. John is a founder member and current director of the Little Mink Milk Company. He's also on the board of the Irish Organic Association and he's chairperson of the Urban Co-op, a community-based organic grocery in Limerick. So John is going to be telling us about his experience of being an organic dairy farmer. Over to you, John. Thank you, Maeve, uh, and thank you folks for the invite. Um, uh, just to share my story, um, I changed over to organic uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, uh, before that, I had been questioning uh, my conventional farming system. Um, organic uh, intrigued me uh, in the fact that it uh, at the time was being knocked as a, a fashion or a trend but yet sales were growing and uh, I liked the idea, I liked the ethos, uh, I was being disillusioned with the intensive farming and the more uh, extreme it was getting so um, I eventually uh, uh, became organic in 2002 uh, uh, the people or the organisations I engaged with to get me there uh, were very helpful. First of all, Chagas had organised uh, a discussion group for organic dairy farmers, which was mighty useful in making contacts. Uh, at the time, there was only five organic dairy farmers and uh, numbers were small and beef and all that, but it got people together, got people sharing ideas. Um, uh, so I started supplying milk to a processor. Uh, a, Eventually, uh, the processor needed milk for the winter. Uh, I was a traditional spring um, producer, and uh, myself and a few like-minded people set up the little milk company to have a more traditional uh, system where we um, where we milked our cows during the summer uh, and, and used what um, our, our greatest asset, uh, grass. Uh, we were helped along there uh, by the National Organic Training Skills Net in getting us the expertise uh, and knowledge uh, to make a product that reflected 
uh, this grass-grown uh, milk, uh, and it, it was cheese that uh, was the idea we came up with. Um, I'd have to say um, the people in the uh, Borbia, uh, which uh, who were promoting um, at the time, were, begin were were promoting Irish organic food in Europe. Uh, they initiated with Chagas. Uh, a program in Dublin, a uh, foodworks program, where it brought in small uh, would-be exporters of food, uh, put them through, uh, uh, what should I say, conferences, uh, meetings, mentorships, uh, helping them to organize their product, to market it, to expose them to uh, what's outside there. It was a fantastic uh, opportunity at the time. Um, uh, Tara McCarthy uh, ran the program uh, with Borbia, uh, Enterprise Ireland, Chagas. It, it was a, a fantastically useful project. Uh, it just showed the value of networking, the value of of the semi-state bodies engaging with uh, the small time pro uh, producers and processors. So uh, it was a it was a great uh, learning curve. It was great for a small cooperative of of dairy farmers, organic dairy farmers, to get their product on the shelves. Um, the uh, certification bodies, uh, I'm a member of the uh, Irish Organic uh, Association, as are most of my um, uh, uh, farmer uh, colleagues in, in, in the Little Milk Company. Um, as a certification body, um, fantastic knowledge um, in the they always look forward to their field day programs, their work in promoting in as much as they could, bearing in mind that they're a certification body. Uh, but they are so helpful. And um, any, any would be person thinking of going into um, organic dairy, I, I would engage with these bodies. I would engage with Chagas, the certification bodies. There's also another certification body, the Organic Trust. I, I would be. I, I would uh, advise them to engage with these bodies before they they, they make their conversion or make their move. Um, and and what's fantastic, I, I see now the IFA organised uh, an um, uh, an organic project um, team, uh, and it reflects the growing number of organic farmers in the country. It reflects the growing number of organic organic farmers in the IFA membership. And uh, it gives uh, it gave uh, people a voice through the IFA um, offices, through the IFA expertise experts. Um, uh, it, it's it's what where we can't reach through certification bodies. We can reach through the um, IFA. Uh, Nigel put together a good team there. Uh, recently, we uh, spoke with Board Bia. Um, uh, about the future marketing of organic. Could we have a separate uh, organic label, Irish label? Um, uh, I think Nigel came up with the idea of having an organic origin green. Uh, I think he called it a 007 uh, label. Uh, and, and it made sense, actually. It bonded the uh, producer with the consumer and uh, gave it uh, a credibility and uh, would be easily recognizable. So. All these avenues, all these, uh, as 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 the organic world in Ireland is evolving, uh, more and more people and organisations are engaged in it, uh, and I think at the moment there is about fifty-seven or eight organic dairy farmers in the country. We need more to get, achieve that critical mass for making powder, or making uh, uh, products like butter. Um, uh, cheese products, etc. So uh, we're we're well on the way to achieving that, and uh, with a, a new organic scheme and increased payments coming through, hopefully, um, it, it and the the aspirational farm to fork policy from the EU, give, giving people the impetus, giving people the the confidence to 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 um, to uh, change over to organic dairy. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Sean. Well, it's definitely more than a fashion when you were saying 20 years ago you started out and you're still at it. What really came through to me listening to John there is just the amount of support there is there and how, John, I think you really used that over the years, whether it be talking to Chagas or via the Irish Organic Association, Department of Agriculture, or recently the IFA. I think you gave Nigel an introduction that I was going to give in a few minutes for Nigel. 
So thanks for that. And I'm going to call now on our next panelist, Nigel Renahan. Nigel, as already mentioned, is with the I IFA organic team in, and he's in the Ulster North Leinster oh, Regional right. Chairperson. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. Um, okay. First of all, right. maybe and just this... explain a wee bit about it. Um, Right, I'll just maybe explain a wee bit about the IFA and where my role fits in relation to all this is that I'm regional chairman for Ulster North Leinster and a couple of years ago in, in my role a lot of farmers that were involved in IFA actually mentioned that IFA should have a more active role in relation to organics and representing organics farmers. So we lobbied within our own organisation and we set up an organic project team and I'm project team leader in relation to that there and that was set up in 2016 and we represent all commodities of organic farms within our own organization and we have 70,000 members in total within our own organization and I myself sit on Copa Cotica in a working group in Brussels as well. Now uh, I suppose from humble beginnings we actually winded up in a situation in 2019 where we actually did uh, uh, a day, a producer day, an organic producer day in Marley Park in Dublin. And it was a very successful day. It gave a lot of small producers and a lot of producers around the country an opportunity to come to meet people that they wouldn't generally meet uh, in, a, in an environment where, where you have a, a kind of a, a market stall type thing. And we had speakers and we had chefs at it, all using organic produce. And it went very well. And a lot of people made good contacts and it introduced the public to a very specific uh, area of production which is where you're meeting the actual farmers themselves which is very unique. So from that there I suppose we, we've got to the position where less it has been mentioned already the farm to fork and uh, you know the target of 25% organics within the EU. Now our opinion and the opinion of Copa Kujika is that is a very ambitious target and the one thing that people must remember is that any increase of production needs to be market driven. Like having a target of 25% is good and we agree with that. But the problem is, the reality of that is, is that sustainable is, is good to have sustainability. But equally as farmers, we need profitability. And you can't force the sector or force one area of agriculture to increase production and reduce the prices that the farmers are getting. It has to be market driven, that's very important. But our governments have a huge role in relation to this as well, is that if you look within our own country here, we have 2% organic within Ireland. So to ask us to go to 25%, it's just, it's never going to happen. There's no point in us saying that and you need the right incentives and it would collapse the market and it would destroy organic production in Ireland. So so, so we as an organisation aren't on for 25%. It's just we don't believe it, it's actually feasible. When you consider countries within Europe, it's between 0.35 and 0.37%. And so you have a huge variation within Europe. Now, the latest Cantor figures that have been out this year has actually shown growth of 16.2% in organic um, value and production within Ireland, which is, which is actually 189 million of an increase. Now, that in itself is good, it's great, but the fact of the matter is, most of that there has been imported. And it has been touched on by Gillian as well, is that, you know, to some of her projects that she's doing is that a lot of us farmers are smaller farmers in relation to organic production and we don't have the scale to get into supermarkets and maybe farmers coming together you know will be able to, to to get together and do something like that there in terms of producer groups and we're already looking at that within IFA in terms of a lamb producer group that we've spoke to uh, Board Bia in relation to that and in fact John Liston himself mentioned about we did bring up an organic logo within Ireland itself that just highlights the fact what is organically grown in Ireland rather than using the, just the European label, which the European label is very important because it sets out the standard, but we're looking for something a little bit different that just says what is actually grown and produced in Ireland. 
So that's what we're looking for in relation to that there. We do have, for people that's listening and are wondering, you know, can I get into organic milk production? And what is the barriers getting into organic milk production? Well, number one is sometimes it can be your locality, where you're situated within the country. Who is going to process that milk? And where is that milk going to be processed? Because if you're if you're situated up in in Louth or Meath, where are you going to go? Is there? But if you're over in Donegal or Sligo, at least there you have a Revo, which are actively um, taking a lot of milk. Now. We have the organic scheme. There was it was the last time it was open was 2018, and there was a, a, quite a considerable amount of farmers and actually didn't even get into that scheme. But when you're in conversion, there's a payment there of 220 euros per hectare for the first two years of conversion, and then once you have converted, it's 170 euros per hectare. But as regards milk, and we're focusing on milk today, is that for me to go into milk production here. As an organic farmer, having gone through the conversion, I'm fully certified in January, and I'm asking myself, can I go into milk? What's the barriers for me going into milk production? Number one is, where do I get my stock, my replacement stock? It's very difficult to get them in Ireland. So people that's listening needs to remember, where are you going to get that? A lot of them, our cows are being imported into the country um, from from Holland, from, from different countries in relation to that. So it's a slow process. So if somebody gets in, they have to import the, the, the heifers and then you have to try and breed on for replacements. That's the first thing. So that's important that we get that done. The second thing is that where where do you get rid of the milk? Who's going to be your, you know, if you're thinking of doing home produced milk and selling whole milk, that's grand. But during the summer times, you have a lot of milk and winter times you have less milk. So there's a lot of things to do in relation to that there. Chagas themselves, we need a support scheme for farmers that's going into this. I mean supports like knowledge transfer. One of the biggest barriers in organic production that I have found and most farmers have found is that when you get in, what is the support in terms of knowledge? Knowledge transfer, learning from your peers, knowing about multi-species grasses, and you know, these are these these are these are the things that you need to be to focusing on. Now, we did a lot of lobbying within our organisation in relation to the organic farming scheme. We let with the, the previous minister Andrew Doyle. We met with Pippa Hackett, who has uh, responsibility for this as well. And there's an extra four million has come into organics in terms of the organic farming scheme, which should allow another 500 farmers come into it. And we welcome that, and that's a positive development. But equally, as this is important for people to get into the scheme, it's equally as important for people to have technical follow-up. There's no point in somebody going into organic production unless you're given the knowledge base and the support to keep you actually in organic farming. As I already said, multi-species grasses, red clover mixes. There's a lot of information out there that needs to be relayed. And I suppose us, we will lobby for the likes of Chagas to do specific trials in relation to multi-species grasses and red clover mixes as what can be done. There is a perception out there that an organic farmer doesn't get the same yield as a conventional farmer. That is not the case. Yes, it is the case if you don't have the proper backup structure and you don't have the proper information backing you up. But with proper information, proper advice, it is amazing what can be done. So I just welcome any questions. So that's just a brief outline of where I am. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Nigel. So just to flag, I suppose, what you said at the start there, the importance of not just sustainability, but also profitability and there's a need to find the balance there. And again, you reiterated a lot of the supports that are available. I think one of the key points you're making there is the importance of knowledge transfer that you can learn from other farmers, like peer learning through the IFA and through all the organisations to really be aware of that. And that the, the target of 25% is, it's a challenging target. And we will look at, is that feasible or not? Or, you know, what would it take 25% organic farming throughout the EC? So that's, we've heard from everybody now. Um, we're going to open up the discussion to the panel in general. The first general comment question I'm going to put you is that we're looking at Irish organic dairy farming. Is it a real alternative for conventional dairy farmers? 
why would you do it? I mean, would you do it for economic reasons or ethical reasons? Or what are the kind of reasons would you decide to go down the organic dairy farming route? Would anybody like to comment on that? I, I can come in and out if you want, um, please. We might you take start. Gillian and then you, Nigel, OK? Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks. I mean, I mean certainly we're we're talking to um, farmers um, like like the other panelists here all the time. So we're looking at at what the barriers are. Um, we're I'm also have the seat on the um, CAP consultative committee, the minister's CAP consultative committee, and we're on the national strategy committee, and we're on the real development panel here in Ireland as well. So um, obviously we get a lot of feedback from different things. So. Is it ethical? Is is it economic? I say it's it's both. Sometimes it can be more swayed to one or the other. But another reason um, is actually succession is one of the biggest things that's coming across at the moment. If we look at the farmers that we certify um, and we look at the, the, the age profile, etc., it's interesting to see that it's the younger farmers who have the larger herd stock, not surprisingly, considering the labor, um, the, the labor uh, um, of uh, dairy farming generally. But succession and where do you leave that farm and to whom and to make that farm attractive to the younger generation has been by far one of the most clear messages that we're getting. A farmer who's taking going into organic dairy normally starts, as I'm sure John um, will correct me if, if he knows otherwise, normally starts with um, don't want to get into the price loop of high fertilizer costs, etc. And what alternatives are there? And to be able to farm um, working better with nature, reducing your environmental impact, the writing's on the wall. Um, it, it's fantastic that the European Commission have done the farm to fork strategy, EU Green Deal, biodiversity strategies. These are strategies that, that will have an impact and we can do so much with CAP, etc. But really one of the big issues that isn't maybe, it, it's not a policy, it's not a regulation, regulatory issue, it's actually much more about who do I leave my farm to? And that's becoming much more of a common um, question and certainly much more of a common response to us in the organic sector. Um, in 2015, there were a lot of organic farmers that came in. There was a groundswell of it, mainly because there was a scheme opened and it hasn't, uh, it was only opened briefly and limited but, um, since then. But um, one of the things that many of the farmers basically said to me is my, my best field has now become my worst. And I've been a conventional farmer for many years. So I'm not knocking or nor do we ever knock. It's what we stand for, not against in this organisation. Um, the conventional side, we're not knocking that, but it is interesting that farmers see if I can get out of not having to pay all of these fertiliser costs, maybe give myself a bit more price independence. But the key there is who do I leave the farm? And I don't really want to, or my children don't want to take on something that's um, seven days a week. Uh, 52 weeks of the year, they want to find that work-life balance. I particularly hate that quote, the work-life balance, um, but that's basically what it is. And I think that is actually one of the biggest reasons um, why organics is is is, um, is actually taken root. It's also one of the reasons that a lot of the, the younger farmers that we have um, in dairy, and I will sp stick specifically to dairy, one of the, um, the, the, the reasons that the younger farmers come in, they have a, obviously a larger herd stock, etc. Um, but certainly that is one of the key reasons. They have young children, they want to leave something to them. It might not necessarily be to the male either. It's often that the, the female, there's 25% of organic farmers in, in Ireland are, are, are females, uh, which is a great, well, a better gender balance, maybe not balanced, but certainly proportionally better than, than, than um, the conventional side. But when they have um, a son and a daughter that they think might go into the farm, they'll actually say, well, it might be nice to add value to it. So they see the organics as an opportunity of potentially adding value and, and having a more diverse farm. And diversity is key here. And I think personally, if we're going to take ruralization seriously, um, then organic fits very strongly into that. In terms of the barriers that are coming along, I would say the barriers are not the farmers. And actually the barriers is possibly not even the cap. The cap can only do so much. Policy and supports can help, of course, and um, like the European strategies, they can give you direction and they can signpost ways and way to go. But we really do need the agri food processing industry to buy into it. 
if uh, particularly if butter in Ireland, a famous exported mm -hmm. product here, was to turn around and flip butter over and go organic, we would see a huge groundswell. So I think economic, ethical, uh, other reasons. I think the other reasons are sometimes actually more interesting, and I certainly they have more longevity. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Gillian, for that. Definitely you've brought in a few other factors there around the lines of succession and the need then for um, um, agri-food inputs as well, or the look and look at how that's processed. Um, Nigel, you wanted to say something on that briefly, please. Yes, as somebody who's just come through the conversion period, I fully organic um, in January next year i have looked at dairy and, and i've looked at how i could get into it and i've spoken to a lot of farmers because when you're doing it yourself you know you have it's very unique because i'm in that actual position myself um a lot of farms in ireland tend to be fragmented and there's two ways of getting milk you can get it out of the back of a, a meal lorry or you can get it through production of grass and a lot of farmers now are looking at organic dairy. And if you look at um, organic valley out in America, or you look at any day, it's all about price in terms of economic viability. There's no point in milking 200 cows or 300 cows or 500 cows. It's down to a quality of life and it's down to what is beneficial for you and your family in terms of production and in terms of income and with a better price for organic and managing your farm correctly you can get as good as the income as somebody that that's racing to so in fertilizer to the band plane and you know at milking 300 cows and a guy that's doing milking 40 50 cows organically you can get a a good living out of it with managed well but it comes back to the same point as i said already the knowledge transfer, if you take red clover silage, red clover silage is between, uh, take an average of 18% protein, maybe 14% energy. Generally speaking, somebody making grass silage wouldn't be having that protein and wouldn't be having that energy in it. So it's been, it's, it's, the term smart farming really fits into organic farming because it's making the best of what you have. Sometimes it's not about volume, it's about quality. And that's where it comes in and the ability for farmers to make a better quality life a better quality income without the volume simple as thank you nigel for that i'm afraid you're breaking up but i could hear coming through very strongly that another reason is looking at quality of life is very important from the farmer's perspective in looking to go organic question here now and then open it to the panel just looking at the current measures and supports that are in place we've mentioned various different ones so far what do you think of them john do you think there's enough being done support wise or can more be done or what do you think is working well uh hi Maeve. um uh, yep okay um the supports are there but before you um what shall I say, make your decision based on supports. Uh, you uh, you look at your farming system and Gillian and Nigel have touched on a few issues there that determines the decision making of a farm farmer. Uh, I'd just like to relate to a story told by um, a farmer who was uh, contemplating his future. Uh, would he go more intensive or would he go organic? Uh, his experiences were he spoke to his local Chagas advisor, uh, the advisor called his farm, um, looked at his land and, um, uh, and according to the terminology, it was a milking platform. The advice given was to consolidate all his fields, uh, remove a few hedgerows, uh, more uh, a, net a network of farm roadways, waterways, uh, 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 water systems, etc. Uh, and then to plough the whole lot and reseed it with a monoculture ryegrass. Uh, his herd of cows, uh, which he was very proud of, were uh, no longer a herd of cows, they were a mob uh, in the current terminology. Uh, 
his um, buildings were to be expanded upon, more storage for slurry, etc. Uh, and then uh, when he queried whether he would be uh, uh, board be a compliant, compliant he, he was uh, sure that he would be. His grass was the glossiest grass that he could get. Uh, his equipment was lovely and shiny, so he would be board be a compliant. Um, However, he asked another Chagas advisor, who is a specialist organic advisor, uh, and visited his farm, complimented the farmer on his permanent pasture that was developed over a multitude of years, his hedgerows that would benefit him uh, for other schemes. Um, his, um, what shall I say, his stockmanship, uh, the work to be done to his sheds to convert to organic was no way, uh, was no way um, uh, onerous. Uh, so if you were him, where would you put your future? So uh, organic one, hands down. So uh, the story uh, illustrated two things. Uh, we produce good stuff in Ireland. Uh, um, conventionally, and yet we have to market it to convert it back to convince the consumer that it's good. Whereas with organic, is straight away you're starting off from a, a great start. Uh, so that was the experience of that farmer. And uh, uh, what should I say? There's, it's getting harder for farmers to convert in the fact that uh, there's eighteen thousand conventional dairy farmers. There's something approaching eight billion cows, uh, or sorry, um, is 8 billion litres of milk pro uh, produced, but the herds are getting larger, and the larger the herds, the harder it is to convert. You could go up the narrow road, but it's hard to reverse. So the people that are changing are, are, are the people that are converting to organic are at a crossroads uh, in their farming system. So that's where we need to target them, and that's where we need to uh, uh, what should I say, enroll these people. Thank you. John, thank you. I'm afraid I couldn't hear quite a lot of what you were saying there. Um, but what I did catch was that, you know, you were saying that a number of farmers are at a crossroads deciding which way to go to stay with their current practice or to move over to organic dairy farming. Um, would anybody else like to comment on that? Maybe um, if no, I can just... Uh, yes, Hello? Yes, just because I, I was yes. cut uh, for a moment, but I just had maybe a couple of comments uh, regarding your question, if organics can be actually an alternative um, for conventional farming. And uh, uh, just a couple of comments uh, there, as John already said in his uh, introductory um, a speech, he started to question uh, practices and I think this is what is happening more and more. Uh, also, farming community is uh, um, realizing that, that they can contribute uh, and, and they can actually uh, change uh, the old practices they are, they are uh, simply uh, used to. But I personally do not like to speak uh, about, let's say, organic as an opposition to uh, conventional farming. Uh, for me, organic is um, uh, uh, showing that that other uh, uh, ways of, of producing food uh, or farming are possible. Uh, and now this organic farming is going out from the shadow. So um, uh, so this is this is uh, for sure. Uh, this is for sure uh, also noticed by the consumers. Uh, they, they try to understand what is organic food, that maybe they can buy food without uh, chemicals and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, when we were speaking about reasons, you also mentioned what would be the reasons why the organic farmer is entering the scheme. Uh, clearly, uh, you have to be convinced. You have to arrive like John to this conclusion that maybe this is the time for me to, to change. Uh, but besides uh, the, the satisfaction, uh, clearly, uh, clearly, the, the market is showing that uh, that uh, organic production will pay back 
not only with this satisfaction. And this is also what uh, what um, uh, Nigel, uh, I think, mentioned in in his in his um, speech that uh, that the value of organic market is growing, is booming, and this increase is just incredible. Incredible! It's a double digit growth from one year to another. Also in Ireland, and I I understand what you. Said said uh, that mostly it's because of imports but this is exactly a message we want to send today the organic market value is growing also in ireland consumers are searching for those products in ireland so this is why one of the arguments why you could uh, search for 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 measures support and try to organize the system so that you provide organic food to your consumers organic food that is produced 10 kilometers from the shop and maybe not one 10,000 kilometers from from the shop thank you daria and a you know very interesting point there the idea that not have kind of an us and them that it's organic farming or not organic farming but all the different sorts of farming can complement each other, which is very much, I think, echoing what Julian was saying, that it's about raising standards across the whole broad spectrum of farming and everybody working together to do that and bringing each other along. I'm going to mention now the Green Deal. This is, we, we mentioned it several times, obviously it's very topical. And as we said, it envisages that organic farming would make up to 25% of EU farming. In, in the coming decades. Now it is very ambitious, as Nigel has said. And in light of the Green Deal, I'm going to ask you, does the Irish government need to change its approach? In the review of the organic food sector and strategy development, it said that organic dairy farming needs to be reviewed, there needs to be a more proactive approach in light of the Green Deal. So what needs to happen for this to come through to, to give more support there, to make it more attractive? And you, you've mentioned things like more involvement with the food industry. If you produce lots of milk, where does it go? Is organic farming happening, dairy farming happening on a large enough scale to make it viable to look for this increase to 25% of organics? Can I ask John to comment on that? Um, hi, Maeve. Um, yeah, um, how is organic uh, dairy going to grow in Ireland? Um, Certainly we need scale. We need to be able to use the large um, processing units. We need to be able to bring in tanker loads of milk into a processor. Um, and it's beginning to happen. Uh, uh, primary product in a, a developing organic market uh, dairy-wise is liquid milk, what people use every day. Then it evolves to value-added product. Um, so. To make the butter, the cheese, uh, we need to possibly uh, collaborate more, um, get the big uh, cooperatives, get the big PLCs involved. Um, they are not becoming involved because they are, a lot of decisions are short term. What will we do next week or next month? But with the EU policies coming to the fore, they're beginning to ask questions. The two-year conversion is a bit off-putting to them, uh, and it's probably off-putting to the uh, converted uh, the, the farmer that converts to organic as well. Uh, okay, it has the supports, the initial two-year conversion high rates. Uh, in other European countries, uh, speaking to farmer organisations, there, the second year uh, the farmer gets a bonus on his conventional price just to tie him in. Uh, it's something we probably should look at here. Uh, it could be part of a grass-fed initiative. It could be part of an animal welfare issue as well, just to get uh, an extra price for that farmer. Remember, he's in his two-year conversion, he's farming organically, but he's taking conventional prices. So there has to be an incentive there as well, and it's been looked at. And... Uh, um, uh, having listened to Nigel there, where he uh, speculated on getting into dairy, who would take his milk, uh, what uh, when he when he where would he purchase his cows, etc. Uh, all this, uh, the knowledge transfer groups would be a perfect answer to this. Uh, uh, meeting with your peers, meeting with uh, specialised uh, people that are are familiar with the industry. 
uh, that 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 would um, stimulate growth, uh, and uh, I would welcome that knowledge transfer scheme uh, when it comes in. But uh, certainly, it's um, to stimulate people to come in. Uh, just look at the uh, at the shelves uh, on your on your on your local corner store. Um, if you even go into the Bible Belt or the Rust Belt of rural Ireland, you will see uh, organic yogurt. You will see organic porridge. So the products are reaching out everywhere, uh, and uh, uh, that should tell you people are making the conscious choice to buy to purchase organic. That um, what you produce, you will have sale for. And just to reinforce that belief in people, that uh, confidence in converting to organic, uh, that will be the paramount, um, what shall I say, object of uh, any new scheme. Thank you. Thanks, John. So I suppose really what you're saying is that you know the market is there, but we need further collaboration with the, the larger agri-food PLCs and that they plan long term to have further involvement with organic products and link that into EU planning and regulations that's coming through. So there's sort of a, a multi-sectoral approach there. And also as the, the two-year conversion, I think, is a stumbling block for a lot of people, just that there is that sort of pause between the, the two types of farming. So again, replicating practice in other countries of bringing in some sort of bonus in the second year. And again, talking about the knowledge transfer scheme, the importance of that. Does anybody else have anything to add to you know changes that could ch changes that need to be made to encourage yeah. the sector of um, the government in Ireland? Yes, Nigel. Yeah. And that would take Daria. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, there's a couple of very important things that I, I'd like us all to remember is that yes organic production uh, con consumption as in volume and value have gone up in 2020 by 16.2 percent which is 189 million but we let's just focus on what we actually do produce and can produce in this country because there's no in that mix let's be honest with each other and I know we've talked about, you know, it's increased in Ireland as well, but we have to remember a lot of that organic produce that has been sold could be bananas, it could be nuts, and a lot of produce like that there, and we cannot grow that in Ireland. So that's the first thing. So if we took that away from that there, we'd look at that. Organic dairy rose by 8% in Ireland this year, and, you know, organic fruit, you know, in sales terms, and organic fruit rose by 20%. So that, that's a lot of volume in relation to that. Now, organic meat went up 32.6%. So there, there is options there. In, you know, these are things that we can't in Ireland, we can't uh, produce. But another thing that a lot of consumers and a lot of people need to realize in Ireland, and it's one word, and it, it's, we've got to get back to this. If we talk about getting back to doing organics, talk about getting back to nature. We also need to remember one of the most important things here also is seasonal, seasonal production. This thing of going into a supermarket and being able to buy strawberries in the first week of December isn't exactly, or February, isn't exactly natural. And I think the consumers have a lot to learn in terms of what can be produced seasonally in, in Ireland or in any country. And I think that'd be, that's a very, very important message for people to get. So consumer education leading to demand of organic products at, at the appropriate times. Daria, you were looking to come in on that as well. Yes, because you mentioned clearly Green Deal, and I think I have to demystify a little bit this 25% uh, target um, uh, because it is an ambition and we are, are aware of facts. So so for every you know that only few countries in uh, the European Union currently are um, over 10%, not speaking about over 20%, because over 20% is only two countries. And worldwide, I think it's only eight countries that are reaching over 20% of their farmland um, being under organic uh, management. So we all know that. But what this Green Deal, what this target uh, uh, shows, it shows that, that uh, we are uh, um, now putting an emphasis that uh, exactly what you said, Nigel, that nature is important. We should take care of nature and nature will take care of us. We should take care of the biodiversity. And we have already a policy 
that could somehow respond to those challenges. And this is organic policy. So let's emphasize this policy. Let's put a target on it. But every, but from the beginning, it's very clear that this is the ambition and nobody would, uh, will, uh, let's say, force Ireland to reach 25% in, in, uh, in a few years, because as you said, it's simply impossible. And of course, what we are doing as the European Commission, we are now starting a dialogue with your governments, uh, with all governments of the European Union about how to accommodate the ideas from the Green Deal, the ambitions of the Green Deal. We are checking how every single country can contribute to those to those uh, uh, new targets. But uh, this is a discussion that is that is uh, starting uh, now. As the Commission, we will try to show uh, what are the advantages of of uh, supporting um, uh, supporting organic farming. And uh, very important here, uh, when we speak about uh, the support, it's not only money very important what John said. There are so many other uh, instruments, so many other ways of supporting the sector to grow. Like, for example, this, this very easy access to research and innovation, uh, uh, like like access to, to advisory systems, um, uh, like uh, sharing your experience with with other peers uh, like stability stability of the rules maybe stability of the also of this support schemes uh, that are there so promoting promoting your own pro products so a set of ideas uh, are already there in the action plan i mentioned before this is what we are trying to do we are trying to to reach out to you to to uh, for a, for an advice for an advice what is there we should promote we should uh, look at in order to help this this uh, sector to grow and my last comment here this is in relation also what what um, uh, Nigel said uh, short supply chains very important and in this new organic regulation we will uh, we will we will put an emphasis on short, short supply chain that in my opinion should be also in the heart of organic production thank you okay thank you for that Dari. so very clear message then on the importance of support schemes peer supports stability rules and again i'm going to give you a reminder of making sure that you take part in the consultation that daria mentioned before the 27th of november and we'll put a link at the end of this zoom meeting to that now we're coming up to half three we said we'd spend an hour on this i've pretty much covered the questions that have been sent in by the, the, the zoom audience so i'm just going to give each of our panelists an opportunity to say a final few words um, and I suppose maybe if there's one, I would say to you, if there is one thing that you'd like people to take away from this discussion, if they're considering continuing starting or expanding a dairy farm. Um, I'll start with Gillian. Um, ammonia emissions are up through the roof. Our climate issues are here, our environmental issues, we all know what they're going to be, whether we have to buy carbon credits or taxes or whatever, or whether we're going to put a tax on farming. And all of these things are on the table at the moment for discussion. And in terms of organic, I think, I feel obviously, because I work in the sector, that the, um, the farm to fork strategy is, is actually very well considered. It is an ambition, as Daria said, it, it's the programme for government has set an 8% target, which is, is probably more tangible. Um, but I also feel that if products are on the shelf, people will buy them. You can't support organic products if they're not on the shelf. And we're running an EIP. I bear, okay, fair enough, it's a, on the horticultural sector. But the retailers, the multiples have said how much they could actually supply if it were available. And it, of an Irish, of Irish origin, being sold in Ireland, and it is impressive. It is actually a, a very, um, that was the whole point of our REIP is that actually to look at shortening the supply chain. That's what it's all about. Um, but I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning it. I, I just texted him, he hasn't responded, but he did give me permission last week to say it. Um, John, obviously from the Little Milk Company, they're going from strength to strength. Um, and Glenisco also is, is up 40% year to date. So, I mean, they're growing at a steady 20% per year. They're also looking for, for new processes, um, for, sorry, new um, uh, farmers, organic dairy farmers to come on board. So there is a market there. 
I do feel very strongly that the policy and the supports is something that is now, um, since we've had the um, financial framework recently agreed at cap level, these are things now for discussion. Eco schemes are going to form a large part of that, however, they're going to transpire and look. But certainly, I believe that going forward, it is a really tangible solution. And I feel very strongly that organics is part of that solution. And I think it's only when the taxpayer is starting to buy and contribute towards tax credits um, that we're going to have to really start moving into alternatives. And I, I appreciate entirely that um, large, um, larger sort of dairy processes are also um, employing an awful lot of people and contributing an awful lot in the kind of socioeconomic aspects. But I feel as well, as John also pointed out, that sometimes it's a very short term view. So we can have all these fantastic policies, etc., but we do need them to buy in. Because one thing we do know, when it goes on the shelf, that organic product, it sells. And, and the most recent, um, uh, for example, the Board Beer, uh, recent study there shows that um, very high significant amount of people, over 91% of Irish retail consumers now are buying organic products. Nearly 40% of that is because of quality. Uh, as, a, as a reason and 20 sorry 34 percent of that is also because it's organic and then health tastes and marriage origin are all, are all factors of that as well so it is difficult to sell the product but it has to be an organic product certified organic not almost organic the real thing and i think with the right supports and um some discussion uh, further discussion uh, with the processing industry, we can actually get there. But there are processors out there at the moment who are actively looking for people to come into organics. Thank you. Thank you for that, Gillian. Nigel, can I get a final comment from you, please? Yeah, final, um, first thing is, I have to say, the organic farming scheme needs to be open in Ireland to let people into it, first of all, because if it's not open, nobody can get in. That's the first thing. The second thing is, as a farmer, you need to look at where are you going to get rid of your milk to? Who's going to buy your milk? Are you close enough to, to somebody who's going to take it? As John says, who's going to pull up in the tank and take the milk? That's the, the second thing. The third thing is that uh, where are you going to get the stock from? And the most important thing on top of all that is, is your advice. You need quality advice in relation to going into organic dairy and um, growing your, you know, your, your having your, your, as I say, multi-species swords in terms of red clover mixes and how to, to maximize your potential. And that's them, them four things I think are, is the most important and getting a, a market. It, it doesn't like, for, for it doesn't have to be dairy and for everybody, but there's, there's, there's opportunities and there's niches out there, but you need to do the market search. There's no point going to dairy and if there's nobody there to collect your milk, unless you're going to sell it directly yourself. And to do that there, it's, that's a big, big undertaking. But that's my advice. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Daria, can I ask you a final comment, please? Sure. So I will just build build up on what, uh, what Gillian said. Your consumers cannot support organic Irish products if the organic Irish products are not on the shelf. So if you a potential um, potential uh, future organic um, Irish uh, dairy farmer, please don't be scared. I know you, you it requires to be proactive. Uh, you need to search for information, but information is there. It's very easily available. And John's story showed us today that that there is already some support that that uh, that there is a support for you uh, when you can reach out and you can learn from them. Uh, we need Irish organic uh, farmers to show to show the example that that okay we are going out of the comfort zone and we can do things uh, differently. But what is the most important? We don't want you only to enter organic scheme we want you to enter stay and succeed so this is this is uh, this is what we want and i will finish with one sentence who if not irish dairy farmers well that's a challenge for everybody anyway thank you daria john i'm going to leave the last few words to you uh yeah um I would love to see uh, in the new uh, organic scheme uh, more uh, tree planting, uh, agroforestry. Uh, Irish cattle farming uh, was built upon uh, systems evolved in open woodland. 
uh, hay making, silage making were non-existent until the late 1800s. Uh, forestry and farming are not exclusive to each other, they should be incorporated. Um, I welcome Gillian's comments, uh, things should be, or if we're selling organic, they should be organic, they shouldn't be chemical free, so if it's organic, it should say it's organic. Um, I uh, involved in a local community co-op, the urban co-op, as you see the logo behind me. Uh, consumers want organic, uh, they're not happy with um, uh, other uh, stories, it has to be organic. As I say, nearly never bulled a cow, so it has to be organic. Um, so I look forward to a new scheme. I look forward to more people uh, <laughs> joining uh, um, and becoming suppliers of the little meat company, as uh, Julian had, had, uh, had uh, promoted us. So with that, I, I thank you very much. So thank you very much. Thank you. So a final thank you to all of our speakers this afternoon. Daria Hawat, Nigel Renahan, Julian Westbrook and John Liston. Just a reminder, this session has been recorded. You'll get it on the Europe Direct Sligo YouTube channel and you'll also get links to the various different organisations and supports that our panellists mentioned that will all be on the Europe Direct website. I'd like to say a quick thank you to Pat Gannon from Europe Direct who organised us all here. Thank you very much Pat, we couldn't have done any of this without you. You would have contacted each of us and briefed us all on the, the, the session afternoon. I'd also like to thank James Denson from Studio Robe who connected us all despite all our broadband challenges. And most, I'd like to thank all of you who attended this event on Zoom and for your interaction and your questions and comments. The very best of luck to all of you. Thanks to everybody and stay safe.